Hi everybody, welcome back to theCUBE here at Hadoop Summit uh, in San Jose. I am Jeff Kelly with wikibon.org. We're here on, uh, again on SiliconANGLE's theCUBE. Uh, my uh, co-hosts, Dave Vellante and John Furrier just stepped out for a minute and uh, I'm going to have a conversation now with our next guest. Uh, we've got a big data practitioner on. His name is Vaclav Petrushek, a principal data scientist at eHarmony. So Vaclav, welcome and apologies if I mangled Hi your Jeff. last name a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank uh, you. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, as you know, long-time watchers of the Cube will know, we love to get practitioners on to talk about what they're really doing with big data. So why don't we start with uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of uh, your role at eHarmony as a as a data scientist. Yeah. So uh, I run machine learning applications at eHarmony. You know, trying to decide who we should introduce to who and um, you know uh, when. And uh, for that, we use Hadoop and uh, large-scale machine learning and. Uh, you know, eHarmony is a bit different than uh, you know your typical dating site. Uh, typical dating sites are uh, search-based, so you specify your criteria, and then you get back results that match your criteria, right? eHarmony is a bit different. So we were founded by Dr. Neil Clark Warren, who was a marriage counselor and clinical psychologist in Pasadena, and you know he was working with married couples, and quite a few of the married couples who were coming to him uh, were in failing marriages. And so we thought, like, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could help people to find and meet the person that they are not only attracted to, but also that they are compatible. Mm -hmm. So that maybe 20 years later, they would be still enjoying spending time <laughs> together and doing things. Right, so, so talk a little bit about the, the underlying um, data infrastructure and some of the tools you use and some yes. of the techniques you use. So, because yeah. you mentioned uh, other sites are more search-based. You, yeah. that's what the user basically says, here's what I'm looking for, and then, basically a search engine spits back some results. So you actually write algorithms that actually try to determine based on a number of things, a number of characteristics I yes. imagine, uh, who is the best fit and who yeah. in 20 years you'll still be happy to be waking up next to. Exactly. Um, so tell yeah. us a little bit about how you go about actually developing those algorithms and what are some of the characteristics and how do you even get the data that you base those algorithms on? Yeah, yeah so the to match people effectively, we need to solve three separate problems. So the first one is compatibility for the long term, which I just spoke about. Uh, and uh, then this, not everyone who is compatible is actually interested in each other. You know, people who are psychologically compatible, might, there might be too big age difference, they live on the other side of the planet, or you know, there might be some other deal breakers. Uh, so that's what we call affinity matching, where we try to match people who will be actually in, mutually interested in each other. You know, so not only one way, but also the other person would be interested because to get married you need consent of both, right? <laughs> and then finally the third problem that we are solving is the distribution problem. That means like who to introduce to who and when. Mm. And then so for the first problem which is compatibility, uh, we have a relatively large scale sample of, uh, you know, uh, as measured by psychological research, we have thousands of married couples and we know how happy they were, what kind of personalities they are, etc. Mm -hmm. But still this is not really web scale data. Yeah, mm -hmm. So the techniques that we are using there to build the models are slightly different. Uh, where we use Hadoop and uh, large-scale machine learning, that's for the affinity part. Okay. So to predict whether two people would be interested to talk to each other, we have this historical data because eHarmony has been around for more than 10 years. We have all the uh, information about which people we have in matched and did they uh, uh, communicate, were they interested in each other, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's where we employ Hadoop and large-scale machine learning. Okay. And then finally for the distribution step, we have some uh, in-house solvers that solve the problem, you know, the constraint optimization, mm -hmm. who to introduce to who, when, you know, considering that we don't want to overload people by dumping thousands of results on them, but ah. we want to give them sufficient choice. Mm -hmm. so, so it sounds like, so the first part is all around um, kind of more traditional type of research where you're trying to just understand based on, I guess, research that psychologists have done over the years yeah, and the more traditional literature. Definitely in, in formed by the psychological and marital satisfaction research. Mm -hmm. Okay, know. so let's talk about that middle portion where you're using Hadoop. So you've got all this historical data. Yes. Um, so you've got, you mentioned you've been around for about 10 years. So so what kind of data do you have? I imagine the kind of questions that you ask people who when they join eHarmony are today are very different than they were 10 years ago. Um, tell us a little bit about the type of data and maybe how do, how do you get the data? Do you ask people, is it a questionnaire? How does it actually work? Yes. 
So we, uh, of course, over the time, our questionnaires have evolved, but still there are some questions that have survived this whole process or they you know, sort of get at the underlying uh, psychological traits at the same one. So some of these haven't changed very much. But so we get the information from users, uh, you know, from this relationship questionnaire that they need to fill in when they are joining the site, which is, in, you know, right now it is about 150 questions. It used to be about 500. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's a lot of data. You know, we get to know people immediately as they uh, get in. Today, after the talk, I was getting this question, how do you solve the cold start problem? Y you know, like, how do you make recommendations for people who are just new to the site? Mm -hmm. We actually know a lot about people because they tell us. They tell us how far they are willing to travel. We know their personalities. Uh, we know their, uh, all their attributes. So, but this is not everything that we are using. We also collect the behavioral data. You know, like, uh, uh, people are using our site. They are communicating mm -hmm. to some people. They are not communicating to others. They are engaging in different types of communication and uh, they are logging in every day, every other day, several times per day. They use different mobile devices. All this information we collect and uh, that's available for the machine learned models then to make decisions on who is right for, for who. Mm -hmm. All right, this is really interesting. So now a couple things that kind of came to my mind as you were speaking. So you're asking a lot of questions, about 150 questions. Um, now, if you were to, do you base your algorithms and some of the recommendations you make on how people honestly answer those questions? Or, because we know some people won't, don't always answer honestly, maybe don't even realize they're not answering honestly, but do you actually say, take, those, take that data and actually take that into account when you're running algorithms? How does that, how do you go about kind of filtering yes. out some of those things people think they believe, but maybe don't really? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, comment here. Uh, so, yeah, of course, there is no way uh, you can force people to tell the truth, right? Like they can choose every uh, every option on that side. But uh, however, we set up all the whole process in such a way that it's obvious to the users that the incentives are to answer everything truthfully so that they get the right matches. Because if you are going to pretend that you are a different personality type, you will just be matched with the wrong person, right? So the incentives are definitely set up uh, mm -hmm. so that we elicit the truthful preferences from people and their real behavior. And yeah, there it's a, it's a science in itself to basically design these questionnaires in such a way so that you actually get at the underlying psychological mm -hmm. traits and not at uh, what the person would like to be, right? So, so that's one thing. Uh, but uh, for example, for preferences, we have some questions which actually correlate even like with uh, user attractiveness, sort of self-reported user attractiveness. So you would think that that thing might be, uh, you know, very unreliable. But when you look at the data, you actually see that people who report a certain level of attractiveness, how they per perceive themselves, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do well with other people who uh, who answered in a similar way, mm -hmm. right? So even questions where like there is no way to verify uh, mm -hmm. are useful for predicting who will be interested to talk to who. So it's not as so much whether the answers answers are truthful, but what you can you can still take that data and derive certain things from it and connect people who are likely to connect. Yes, and so even data which might be slightly skewed could be predictive, but on the other hand, we don't see this problem very much. Mm -hmm. I know there were studies on other dating sites where like men would inflate their height and income and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, other attributes. Uh, we don't see it that much because, y you know, like uh, answering our relationship questionnaire takes time. Mm -hmm. Everyone on the site is for long term, for serious relationship. So once you go through this big process and you go on your first date, it's you can be like revealed very quickly and, mm -hmm. you know, you can be reported by our users mm -hmm. as like misrepresenting yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's not the most efficient way to lie and, you know. You know right. Uh, well, I guess my point was that some people, you know, they have perceptions of themselves that aren't always accurate. So yeah, absolutely. You can sometimes, but you can still use that data to, to make a prediction. Yes. So you also mentioned, mentioned data around kind of how people are using your site. Are they using, how are they navigating through eHarmony.com? Are they using a mobile device, uh, a tablet, yes. or a phone? How do you use that data? How does that come into the equation of matching people up? Yeah, so we use this data in a very similar way as any other features and attributes we have for uh, about our users. So you may tell me explicitly, uh, you know, where you live, and then I can observe you that you are talking to this type of people, you know then in the end, all of this information is just features for this machine learning algorithm, which you can think of as a black box, which takes all these inputs and produces a prediction, right? So it is not too much different. There, there is some thought that goes into engineering of the features. You know, you need to think about what kind of behavior might be predictive, you know? So if you want to predict communication between people, typically some kind of a past communication patterns will be very predictive. 
So there is some feature engineering that goes into it, which might be slightly different than you know how you would represent the place where that person lives. But otherwise, it's just another feature. And our models, uh, they are using thousands of attributes, you know, which can get expanded into some higher level features, which are derived from this. Uh, and all of them combined contribute to the predictions. And each of them, uh, contribute incrementally to our ability mm -hmm. to predict whether the two people are right, right for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, well, really fascinating. So, uh, so talk about one thing we mentioned. You mentioned to me before we went on is uh, kind of how some people tend to think about uh, dating sites and what they do. Sim very similar to the recommendation engines you might see on Amazon. Um, but as you pointed out, well, you know, on Amazon, you know, Amazon recommends a book you might like, but the book doesn't have to like you back. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. that's an added challenge you have. Um, so that sounds like it makes it a certainly more complicated and difficult problem to to, to crack. Yeah, absolutely. It's an additional restriction. I mean, like uh, if you uh, are recommending movies or books, or you are very happy that you have a bestseller, right? Because you fill your warehouse with this bestseller and you sell it to everybody, and you have economies of scale. Uh, everything is simplified. You are super happy, right? In our case, we just cannot marry one person to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to make much more diverse recommendations, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so this is an added challenge. And uh, you know, all our models are taking into account that the other person needs to like you back. Also, mm -hmm. uh, we want we are optimizing for the number of marriages and number of good marriages that we make. Mm -hmm. um, so let's turn to some of the technology you're using. Um, so you mentioned Hadoop. Uh, so you're you are on the data science side. So I imagine you're probably you know working a little bit higher up the stack using certain analytic tools and uh, to really manipulate the data and test your algorithms, th things like that. So what technologies do you use on a daily basis to help you uh, craft these algorithms and really improve uh, you know what eHarmony does? Yeah. Yeah, but when people think about uh, you know machine learning and data science, they think about these like algorithms and how you tweak the little algorithm, the, the little features and knobs on the algorithm to perform better, right? Mm -hmm. Turns out that like most of the work is actually preparing the data, and typically you get much bigger win from you know adding an additional feature which you didn't have in your data set, mm -hmm. uh, rather than like switching your algorithm for a fancier one, you know, or like ensembling the 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 algorithm with another different technique, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this is generally where you spend a lot of your time. So we we store all our data in a, uh, in house Hadoop cluster in HDFS, which has been very useful because you know the data that is cleaned is present. It's available to everyone. If anyone has a question, they can dive into it. If you want to test some new theory, we can go and do it very quickly. So it's stored in HDFS, and on top of that, we run Hive. Uh, so Hive provides this SQL interface, so anyone with the knowledge of SQL can like test their theory. And uh, we use then Hive to join the disparate data sets which are coming from production and from you know, mm -hmm. you know other systems, uh, join them together, and then do the machine learning modeling. And then, you know, that comes this interesting part that's typically talked about, which is like building the actual model to represent the features, build the model. We use a lot uh, Volpa Wabit, which is an open source uh, large scale machine learning supervised online learner mm -hmm. written by John Langford, uh, who is now at Microsoft Research in New York. And uh, that's a super fast machine learning uh, tool. And um, it can actually even scale on the Hadoop cluster using the already used uh, parallelization that is implemented there. Uh, but it's already super fast. It could run on your laptop, you know, on very on data sets of most companies, you know, mm -hmm. that are probably coming here. So that's a very cool tool. Otherwise, uh, other tools like R, statistical package for visualization, it has a decent implementation of gradient boosted decision trees. Mm -hmm. There is another uh, interesting implementation of uh, uh, gre uh, regularized greedy forests. You know, all these kind of algorithms bring a different, you know, view of the data, and then you can find the f uh, use the features that you discover, mm -hmm. or maybe like ensemble them together with. The uh, all together to get better predictions, and finally, we have been uh, we had some luck also with um, like looking for f new features using genetic algorithms. Mm. So that actually provides surprising lift also even on top of uh, gradient boosted trees. Wow! So you really you're you're open to whatever whatever works and really looking absolutely at and being like flexible. And so so I guess actually we've got time for just one more question. So mm. uh, you know we have a lot of people out there who are watching want to kind of understand how how to better work with data. So what are some of the maybe attributes in a, in a data scientist you would look for if you were building your own team? Um, it certainly sounds like one of them would be, you know, use whatever tool is useful, really. But uh, what are some of the attributes you look for? What makes a good data scientist? 
Yeah, I, I like the definition of Josh Wills, uh, who, uh, who defines it as like data scientist is this guy who is better pro at programming than any uh, any statistician, and he's better at statistics than any developer, right? So you know there is like this whole spectrum from someone who really knows the systems and uh, you know can write uh, uh, code that scales very much, and on the other hand, as uh, of the spectrum, someone who does re uh, re basic research in statistics, you know, on the statistics methods and actually there is space for a lot of people with different skills mm -hmm. uh, I find that like in industry you generally it's easier to teach people who are developers you know and who are very good at programming uh, uh, machine learning and how to use it and how to build things than it is to teach a statistician who is very interested and you know in the theory behind statistics how to develop you know practical recommender systems. Mm -hmm. So I think like uh, for a data scientist in the industry, definitely it helps to have a very strong uh, development background. All right, great. Well, some some great advice. So uh, Vaclav, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff, for Harmony, uh, principal data scientist there. Just learned a lot about uh, how eHarmony helps match people up, and uh, I just want to assure my wife I'm, we're, we're happily married. That's not why we did this <laughs> segment. So that was my lame attempt at humor. So anyway, thank you so much for uh, coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, and we'll be right back. We've got more guests. We're going to be going all day here at the Hadoop Summit 2013 in San Jose. You're watching theCUBE.